Hi, this is Erwin Lazar, Vice President and Service Director at Nemertius Research, and welcome to our first webinar in our Intelligent Customer Engagement Series entitled AI Drives Measurable Success in Customer Engagement, presented by Nemertius President and Founder Robin Garris. A replay of this webinar will be available in our channel shortly following this session. Today's webinar consists of an interactive presentation and a moderated Q&A period. Please feel free to submit any questions you may have along the way, and we'll do our best to answer all of them. With that, let's go ahead and get started, and I will turn it over to Robin. Wonderful. Thank you, Erwin, and welcome, everybody. Uh, happy to be here today talking about this topic. As, um, as I'm sure everyone knows who's on the call, it's, um, it's certainly a topic of much discussion in organizations, <clears throat> excuse me, in organizations today. So um, let's go right ahead and get going. If I move the slides forward. Um, all right, I'm going to start with a quick about Nemertis. For those of you who don't know us, I will go into a quick overview of AI um, as far as where it fits into the whole intelligent customer engagement area um, with some you know, additional information on some of the topics and subtopics. I'll go into some of the methodology and participant profile of the research I'm going to go over here. And then we'll go into some of the really good you know, output from the research. You know, how are companies using it? Um, to what extent are they using it? What are some of the success metrics and case studies? And then how can we help um, at that point? All right. So very quickly about Nemertis. We are a, um, those of you who don't know us, a global research and strategic consulting company. We, we focus on analyzing the business impact and the business value of emerging technologies. So um, you'll see a lot of that today. We basically really try to gather um, you know, just real world operational and business metrics through the research that we do in the you know, ultimate goal of helping organizations um, achieve successful transformations. And you can see on the left-hand side the various topics that we cover. Um, in the middle is the research that we conduct. And um, this will be primarily focused on the benchmarks, which are live discussions with IT leaders. So we actually interviewed um, folks. And then we also conducted uh, electronic surveys of pre-qualified people to augment that data. And then um, we, we, you know, some vendor discussions here as well. But it's primarily the first two bullet points under the research we conduct. And then services we provide, um, research advisory services, which is just an annual relationship that we have with most of our clients. Um, however, some work with us in other areas, having us do some strategy and roadmap consulting or help us with their vendor and technology, or I'm sorry, we help them with their vendor and technology assessment. We do cost modeling, um, maturity models. Uh, we have an annual conference called Navigator 360. And, you know, of course, we do a lot of speaking um, and you know, webinars like this, and, and obviously Erwin and I both really enjoy doing this because, you know, we, we spend all this time conducting the research, which we enjoy, but it's great to be able to share the information and hopefully help, you know, this data will help you make better decisions. So with that, let me talk a little bit about the research itself that you're going to see here today. Um, here I talk about intelligent customer engagement. I want to explain what we mean by that. So basically, it's contextual information that's delivered to either employees, typically contact center agents, or customers to improve the overall experience on either end, um, hopefully on both ends, uh, whoever the customer is talking to at your company and your customer. So ultimately what you're trying to look at in this situation is whether people have increased sales, um, whether you've, you know, you've improved customer ratings or decreased your cost. So at your company, rather, you, know, you want to really look at whether those metrics have improved because of this contextual information that you've delivered. And typically, what we're seeing in our research is you know, when companies do this right, they are in fact seeing pretty measurable, pretty significant increases to their sales and decreases to their costs and improvements to their customer ratings. And you know, there's certainly a lot that you can do culturally. There's a lot you can do with your leadership to improve, you know, the experience that your customers have. But technology is absolutely required to, to really provide that true customer, uh, intelligent customer engagement. So uh, some of the key areas of technology, all happen to begin with an A there, uh, artificial intelligence and its, and its derivatives, such as machine learning or deep learning, um, automation and analytics are some of the big ones that we see organizations looking at. So if I just look at um, you know, some of these, a couple of these areas like artificial intelligence, you can see on the left-hand side all the different subcategories of technologies that are in artificial intelligence. You know, everything from 
agent analytics to chatbots to you know natural language processing and robotic process automation, self-service, speech analytics, sentiment analytics, or, you know, analysis, all sorts of categories as you can see there. On the right-hand side are just some of the vendors. I mean, it's by no means an exhaustive list. There are literally hundreds and hundreds of vendors in this space and more starting up every day. This is a big area of uh, funding for private equity firms and venture capitalists, so it's it's really one of those areas that's just heating up like crazy. And as more companies come in, you know, we already have seen and we'll continue to see more and more consolidation of some of those startups, but a lot of really great technology innovation happening in this space, um, you know, artificial intelligence broadly and holistically, but specifically in the CX space, there's a lot going on here. And then, of course, uh, you, you know, AI and analytics really, really do go in, go hand in hand. I mean, you can have analytics, and if you don't use some of the AI along with it, or if you use AI but don't analyze what you're doing, you're not going to be successful. These really, really do go hand in hand, and they oftentimes are even in the same product. Sometimes analytics is sort of a separate product. Um, oftentimes it's part of AI. But you can see all the different categories there on the left-hand side. Um, you know, everything from complaint monitoring and feedback collection. You can also use sentiment analysis here in analytics as well. Um, you know, gathering in uh, customer health scores, looking at usage tracking, things like that. Um, and then, uh, again, a ton of vendors in this space, uh, very similar to AI, a lot of investment going into these vendors. There's, you know, there's those who have been around for a while. You know, you've got the Merits Medallia, you know, Clara Bridge. You've got, um, you know, some of the, the companies who already provide, you know, say, contact center solutions like Avaya, you know, you've got Nice in Contact in there, you know, several others, Genesis, for example. Um, and then you've got a lot of the newer, um, more leading edge companies um, that are also, you know, coming about, which are many of the other ones in here. Okay. So with that, uh, just a little bit about the research itself. So we conducted this from March through June of this year, so it's very new research. We interviewed 15 uh, business or IT leaders, and then we surveyed another 503, so a total of 518 in this research. And um, we conduct very, very stringent data integrity checks. So the, um, you know, we look at this, these responses um, on the electronic side line by line and make sure that it's very, very good data. Um, we gathered it on multiple providers and technologies, so we're going to have, I think, five or six webinars in this series. This is just one slice of the webinar data, um, or I'm sorry, of the uh, research data, and there's a lot more to come in this space. And uh, so, you know, make sure you register for the whole series and, and you'll get a lot of really good information. And we did a lot of different uh, correlations in the research, too, that you're going to see, you know, based on things like uh, size of company industries and so on. It's not sponsored research. It's part of our regular research lineup that we do every year. So um, even though you saw some vendors in there, nobody sponsors this research. Okay. And now on the participants, just very quickly before we get into the, the meat of it, uh, you can see a variety of industries here um, in the research data, uh, ranging from the typical financial services, manufacturing, you know, education, healthcare, and, and, and so on at the top there with uh, and then a bunch more underneath that, of course. And the functional role of the participants, you can see it's roughly half and half, a little bit slightly more heavily weighted to IT people, but we talked to both IT people who provide the technology infrastructure, make some of the technology decisions, manage the technology behind all the customer experience, and then business people as well. So when you look at the breakdown of business people, we've got a lot of C-suite people in there, um, other business units, so just it, it could be any business unit, we specifically pull out as well. Customer experience and sales and marketing are kind of like the two big businesses or, or largest business units that, that come about here, and then all the other ones fit in that other bar. So a good, a good you know, cross mix of um, you know, types of people in this research as well. And you can see a good also mix of sizes of companies. So the two pie charts, the one on the left basically just looks at companies small, mid-size, and large, with small being less than 250 employees, mid-size being 250 to 2,500, and large being more than 2,500. And then on the right-hand side, it's just a, a little bit more of a granular cut, very small and very large added to that. And average number of locations, about 64. But you can see the difference there. Smaller companies have, you know, on average, six locations, whereas, whereas large have 215. So obviously when you look at the different sizes of companies, there's different challenges when you have six locations versus when you have 215 and you're, you're trying to manage, um, 
you know, different um, technologies uh, to connect those locations. And it is a global study, heavy weighting here toward North America, as you can see, about 62% North America, but we have um, representation here from Europe and Asia PAC, the countries, uh, you know, represented um, over there on the right-hand side, and, um, and uh, you can see on the, the bar chart on the right, um, some of the different breakdowns of um, regions as well. North America being the, the most common, followed by Europe, Asia PAC. There's a little bit of Central South America, Middle East in there as well. And that's of, of, uh, the just to distinguish between the pie chart. That's glo that's your headquarters, and then the one on the right hand side is where they do business. So um, obviously their headquarters could be in any of those locations, but they could be doing business. Um, in any of those other global regions like Europe or uh, you know Central America, et cetera. Okay, and and um, one last thing before we get into the data, I just wanted to um, bring up that we do have what we call a success group in this research data, and um, so you're going to see a lot of charts and stuff that that compare the success group with all other company with all other companies in the research, and basically what we did was we looked at companies that have measured success of AI. Um, you know, using AI in their digital customer experience, that's DCX, Digital Customer Experience Initiatives. Um, so the top half of each size band was placed into the success group because we basically said, okay, so you've measured success. What are your success metrics? You know, what, what did you look at? What are the actual numbers? And then we just basically lined up those numbers and said, okay, the people, the companies with the most success are going to be in our success group. Um, the top industries that we saw in that success group, manufacturing, high-tech, retail, and financial services, a little bit more heavily weighted there toward the mid-sized companies. You can see in the pie chart on the right, all sizes of companies represented there, but um, mid-sized companies make up the most of it. We, we, typically, you know, we typically saw that smaller and mid-sized companies went into using AI for customer experience a little bit more cautiously, a little more conservatively. They didn't spend quite as much as larger organizations did, and they saw very quick results. You know, so they went in, they had a, a very pointed project that they were doing, and said, okay, we're, you know, we're, we're implementing, you know, let's say, NLP to see if we can improve our customer ratings. They measured before and after, and they saw success. And we're going to get into some of that in a little bit. But, um, you know, basically they were able to show success, and, and, and it doesn't show in this, in this particular presentation, but I will be talking about this in a future presentation, and that is that just because you're in the success group does not mean you're actually spending more money on AI. What we found in our spendings, just as a little bit of preview, is that the people in the success group actually spent less on AI for CX. They still spent you know, a decent amount of money on it, but they spent less, and now they're actually increasing their spend going into 2020 at a much faster rate than all the other companies. Um, they did also, the success group didn't spend more than all others on uh, AI, but they did in the area of contact center. So we'll get into all that in, in a future webinar on, uh, you know, on the financials of all this, but just an interesting data point. Okay, so let's get into some of the meat of this, and, and let's see what companies are doing here when it comes to AI in customer experience. So right now, we've got more than half of organizations um, showing, well, I should say more than half of their customers are interacting digitally. So what this chart shows you is basically we asked, you know, what percentage, we, we asked them first how many customers they had and what percentage of those customers actually interacts with them via digital channels. And you can see um, the bars along, the blue bars are just by size, very small, small, mid-size, large, very large. And then the total number, so the total, about 56.7% of customers overall are interact interacting with the companies they do business with digitally. The success group, a little bit higher there. You can see the success group is at 59.3%. And this is up slightly from last year when we asked this question when it was only about, I think the average was maybe around 53%. So it's, it, it is climbing um, upward. Now, the other interesting success factor that we're seeing here is that more channels do in fact equate to more success. So what this chart shows you is how many interaction channels, you know, voice, email, social media, uh, you know, video, how many different channels are organizations using to connect with their customers? And so you can see on average that farthest uh, blue bar, all sizes of companies are, are using an average of five channels. So, um, you know, definitely going up a bit. 
And uh, But when you look at the success group, they're at 6.7 on average. So basically what this is showing us is that as you start using more and more channels to interact with your customers, as long as you do it right, you should see more success. And again, not in this particular webinar, but will be in a future webinar, um, when I say doing it right, you don't want to keep adding more and more channels without using omnichannel. So you don't want to add five, ten you know, new, different, new ways for your customers to communicate with you, but not integrate those different channels. So if a customer comes in on web chat um, and then has to be escalated to a video or a voice call um, with a different agent, you don't want to have to repeat everything to that agent. Or if you're calling in over voice and you had um, an email conversation with somebody a week ago about a topic, you don't want to have to repeat everything that was in that email to the agent. You want that all to be right in front of that agent to be able to review. And if you, if you implement all those different channels without integration or omnichannel, then you're not going to be as successful. Now when we look at the success group, this is kind of another a way of looking at this data. So some of the key points to, let me explain the chart first. Some of the, um, the key points here are that um, we asked them, what, what interaction channels are they going to be using by 2020? So you can see, of course, you know, oh, well, and the, the orange bar is the success group, and the blue bar is all others who are not in the success group. So first thing you can see is overall, the, the success group is just using more channels, as was indicated in the, the chart previously. So it just kind of breaks that down and shows you what different channels the success group is using and what, what channels the, all other companies are using. So um, these channels also show you, like when it comes to success, that it's, there, there's more success with AI-enabled customer experience because a lot of our success group, what we're, what we're measuring there is their success in using AI. Um, as you go down this list, you can see that mobile business chat significantly is co correlating with success these days. So these are things like when you go a little bit further down the list, Facebook Messenger, WhatsApp, Apple Business Chat, WeChat. When we combine all those into one group of, of just mobile business app overall, it's, it's in the top three. Um, this just kind of breaks down which one they're using. You can see that Facebook Messenger is used significantly more by the success group. So if you look at how much further out that orange line extends versus the blue line, a big difference there between the 49.8% and 79%. So that's another success factor. You know? So yeah, use more channels, but really consider looking at these mobile uh, business chat applications because that's how a lot of uh, customers want to communicate with their, with their companies they do business with. Okay, so now let's get into the specifics about artificial intelligence and analytics and what we're seeing with the uh, utilization and adoption, how are organizations um, you know, using this technology to improve their customer experience. So first of all, oh, I think I might have skipped a slide. There we go. Sorry about that. Okay. So first of all, you can see that the, the usage plans, um, usage and plans for AI in digital customer experience are really going up. So basically, what you see here is in 2018, 44.6% of organizations were either using or planning to use AI for digital customer experience. That, has, that percentage has gone up by 36% to 60.8% uh, now. So uh, the, the, the percentage of growth is 36% uh, there. More companies actually using um, AI in these initiatives or planning to use them this year. So that's a pretty swift growth in just one year uh, using AI for digital customer experience. So just kind of set a baseline there. A lot more companies doing something in this space. When we look at the sizes of companies, so the first you know, multicolored bar there are larger companies, second one mid-size, third one small. And then we just kind of break down how they're actually using um, AI-enabled CX uh, you know, initiatives. How, what are they actually doing there? Blue is they're using it now. And then you go into various uh, stages of planning. Gold is planning to use in 2019, then planning to use in 2020, you know, um, and then going on, we're planning to use beyond 2020 and then evaluating. So you can see how larger companies are a little bit further along right now than all others. And even as we get into, you know, 2019, they're a little bit further along. Uh, get into 2020, though, you can see midsize really starting to take off there too. And I think what we're seeing there. Um, is that the larger companies that have implemented AI for their DCX initiatives are kind of one in it, you know, full force, a lot of money, a lot of spending, um, and it's taken them a while to get things off the ground and to really be able to measure success and continue to, you know, forge ahead. 
Um, Mid-sized companies, uh, like I said, they, they went a little bit slower, but were able to document success very quickly, and therefore uh, you got a lot more companies planning to do um, AI adoption moving forward as their success rates and you know the impact uh, of, of the technology among their comp you know, competitors. They don't want to be at a competitive disadvantage. So um, you can see also that Europe is slightly ahead in adoption today with AI for their DCX initiatives, but as we look forward and move forward and look at, okay, where are people going to be in 2020 and 2025, um, at that point, Europe is, is slightly um, <clears throat> behind because we ask people you know, we ask organizations if they have no plans at all and europe actually when you look at by 2025 has the largest percentage of no plans at all at least at this point that could change but uh, for right now anyway they have more adoption than other regions so just very quickly how do we see companies using ai for their customer experience initiatives um you know when you look at how an organization is typically set up, and this is pretty high level, obviously, but you know, on one end you've got agents, they could be at a branch location, they could be at a home office, they could be at contact centers for their, um, you know, their headquarters location. And on, the other, on the other side, you've got customers, you've got actual people, but you've also got AI-enabled sensors, so we really pull in some of the IoT here as well. You know? um, and, and either one of these, customers or sensors, are going to you know, have to co communicate at some point with the company. Now, the way they communicate you know, can vary, but what's happening in the middle is really where things get very interesting. So you have all the AI-enabled processing that could be taking place through things like natural language processing, voice transcription, language transcription, um, and translation, and then personalization. And then, of course, as I mentioned before, you know, you've got the analytics. So agent analytics, you could be doing some predictive analytics to, you know, give customers recommendations on what they should buy based on their history, based on um, what other customers are doing, that type of thing, uh, based on external factors like um, macroeconomic uh, decisions, things like that, or, you know, trends that are taking place. Uh, sentiment analysis, of course, so is a customer happy, are they not happy? And then, uh, you know, how do we take uh, action either way? And then facial or image recognition are other areas that are really emerging as well. Um, you know, you could be doing a video and say you're in banking, you could do facial recognition to validate somebody's identity versus having to enter passwords or in addition to, for example. The key is that um, you know you you don't necessarily have a direct link from person to person or sensor to person. There could definitely be bots in the middle there. You know, so you could have virtual agents or you know chat bots that are taking very simple questions and going forward even some more complex questions and getting them answered without the involvement of a human. And we'll talk more about that um, in upcoming webinars. You know how. Um, what the finance, financial impacts are of that, and they're, they're pretty compelling to actually use them, but to use them carefully and, and cautiously and slowly, make sure they're working well. You don't want to ever use AI to, and you know, end up having your customers frustrated. You want them to enjoy the experience. And then you, know, you also have um, up at the top there uh, self-service, happening as well. So, you know, you may be talking to a bot or you may just be talking, you may just be accessing a self-service portal and getting answers that you need through an FAQ or other means. And the key point is that all of these are connected, and there, there's intelligence wrapped around all of this to know what's the best way to communicate at any given time. So where's my intelligent routing coming into play, and and you know how does this whole ecosystem, this whole you know intelligent customer experience ecosystem work together? And, and, and you know, at, like I said, everything's connected to make that happen as best as possible. So when we look at companies using AI today, you know how does it help? Well. 43% say AI helps because it routes their questions to the best person. Um, just a you know, little, slightly less, it resolves um, issues when the company is closed, or resolves issues faster than an agent can. You know, I, I can quickly look something up, or a bot can very quickly give me an overnight mailing address, for example, without me having to call in. Uh, screen pops are helping agents improve the service itself. So it's not only on the customer end, what I get to do when I call in or interact with a company I do business with, it's what do the agents get? So you know, they're getting some screen pops, they're getting some context. They can possibly read 
everything they need to know to help me in this transaction. You know, they can look at my background real quickly. They can look at my most recent interactions. But, you know, what if what I'm saying, NLP can, can do a quick analysis of what I'm saying and basically connect that with a special that the company has just launched that the agent may not even know about to help that agent. You know, Screen Pop comes up, oh, new special, offer this product at this price, um, and, and maybe do some upsell. We're seeing companies increasingly use contact centers for sales, uh, more so than ever before. So as they, they see that happening, I think that's a, an important addition that we're seeing. And then, of course, predictive analytics. Where, you know, what, what should I get otherwise? You can see underneath the green numbers and orangish red there, um, what is the success group doing? Well, in all of those cases, the success group is saying that AI helps um, in a higher percentage of all of these issues. But the one that really stands out the most to me is with the screen pops. Because uh, look at the difference there. All other companies are looking at screen pops. About 34, 35% say um, AI is helping through screen pops and that's helping their agents improve service. Look at the big difference there. You know, when it comes to the success group, it's almost 53% saying this is how AI is helping us. It's not the highest. Um, routing questions to the best person is actually the highest, as you can see there on the far left. But it is the biggest difference. You know, there, there's the biggest gap there. Um, so it's really showing that the successful companies are taking off with using AI within their own companies to help the agents improve service, giving them that context, you know, letting them know about factors that they just don't have time to keep up on during the day. Maybe if you're in a financial services company, you know, you, you're, you've been on calls all day and you're not really seeing what's happening with the market and screen pops can kind of tell you and also not only just tell you but keep it relevant to that particular customer that you're on the phone with. Okay, this customer was concerned, you know, when uh, yields got to this percentage, you need to say X or Y, you know, so really getting it customized and then, of course, predictive for that customer as well. So when we look at actual AI, you know, tied to problems or opportunities, so you, know, you see, first of all, companies, you know, identify a lot of their problems and opportunities that they're trying to solve, which we'll get into in other webinars as well, but right now just kind of staying focused on AI. What exactly are they doing by size of company? You can see, um, you know, agent assistance is, is the top one that companies are doing right now, followed by tracking inventory. Um, you know, so if I'm going to recommend that a customer buy something, I want to make sure that we have inventory, and I don't want to have to go into the ERP system and look that up. I want, you know, I want NLP to know what I'm about to recommend, or what, what you know, based on what the customer has just said, and and quickly behind the scenes go check inventory and make sure that we have what we need, um, so I don't have to look that up as an agent, um, and even customers, you know, so they can look themselves if they're doing a self-service app. Making product recommendations, that gets a little bit more into some of the predictive analytics. Um, companies do script compliance with AI, I'll get into that in a minute. Um, and then some of the chatbot questions, which I'll get into in a minute. Intelligent call routing. You know, we've done skills-based routing for a number of years in the contact center, but this is really taking that to the next level and being able to see something like, okay, I'm calling in, I'm really aggravated, um, the the sentiment analysis in NLP right now. I'm on a recorded bot or you know recorded voice chat bot, and and it's detecting that I'm mad. Or even in a web chat, you know, this my all capital letters might indicate that I'm not happy. And um, in routing that call, you know, first of all, knowing I'm not happy, let's get a live human on right now and get the situation under control. Um, knowing that I'm not happy, the AI engine can look at my customer history, see that in the last five transactions I've had, there are two people that I've actually rated five stars, and the other ones I rated one star. Let's keep me away from the ones I rated one star, and let's route me to somebody at those two stars, if they're available and if they're on, you know, working at that point. If not, maybe somebody else on their team. So there's a whole set of criteria you can use there um, and, you know, and, and get that routed to the right person using some intelligence behind it. Um, and then, of course, I, I talked about you know some of the making predictions. So if I've bought, if I've spent um, a lot of money this quarter last year, chances are I might do it again this year. So you know what kind of um, ideas can we present to help that customer sell more, or, or I'm sorry, buy more, and um, and then some of the more complex questions. So let's let's get into some of these chatbot related um, areas. And by the way, not all virtual agents or chatbots have to be AI-based. Some of them are just, you know, if, um, if you're on a web chat, for example, and you type in a word, it, it may just be looking at a keyword and giving you an answer. Or um, other chatbots might, might give you um, 
like a list. Okay, select all from select something from this particular list, and then it'll you know route you to a you know self service uh, FAQ something like that. So they don't all have to be AI based. So I want to make that clear first of all. So when you start looking at virtual agents, very basic level, you can put bots in that are going to give you know overnight mailing address. Maybe there's some AI built into there based on where I'm coming in from that will give me a different overnight mailing address versus you know another location I might be calling in from. Say if I'm in Europe versus the US. Um, Product information or link to self-service knowledge bases again based on um, something about me or where I'm co where I'm coming in from, um, you know, basic location hours, those types of things. Very easy, very straightforward. You know, then you get to more you know complex Q and A. So maybe it's something like looking up balances or scheduling a service call, all automated check. You know, scheduling scheduling a service call that brings in some intelligence again based on what I might have rated a company before. Um, that type of thing, you know, checking inventory, maybe transferring money, um, you know, having some AI built in saying, okay, would you like to transfer to this account, uh, you know, based on history and what I've done in the past. So, you know, kind of like a lot of self-service, a lot of bot knowledge bases there. Um, other areas that we see organizations using virtual agents today in compliance. So basically assisting agents by delivering them scripts in, in the form of a screen pop to meet company rules or regulations. So we want to make sure that an agent is saying what he or she is supposed to be saying so that we're meeting our rules. You know, we're not um, violating federal regulations in particular. Uh, they can also flag words. So, you know, a lot of times in financial services companies, they have people, you know, who are sitting there scanning emails, and they probably learn a lot more than they want about the employees at their company. But looking and scanning emails, scanning um, uh, instant messaging, and, and trying to find out, you know, are there any keywords that we need to be looking for, either from a you know legal or ethical standpoint, you know, what's going on here? Um, you can move that over to an AI engine and just and just have the AI engine flag things and escalate them to a human to make some decisions. Um, you know, routing calls to qualified agents, as we talked about before. Um, you know, and, it, and it's nice when you have a chatbot too, because if you have compliance, you can always have something show up and make a person, you know, click your a customer actually click that. Okay, I've read this and understand it. Now, whether they do or not, you don't know, but at least you're meeting your compliance requirements there. And it also can flag when agents don't do something they're supposed to do. So if speech analytics predict, you know, can, can listen to a call between an agent and a customer and hear that they did not say these three key words or they didn't read a script that they were supposed to, that can be escalated right away for a to a supervisor for some additional coaching or even disciplinary action depending on how many times it's happened. So that's where you get into some more machine learning, you know, a little bit more uh, sophistication in what you're doing with AI. And then, you know, getting to uh, virtual agents and bots actually helping with recommendations. So this gets a little more complex. Um, you know, recommending products based on something that I might have entered or my history, location, other customer patterns. You know, as we buy online, you go to Amazon, you always see things like, uh, you know, oh, people who bought this also bought this. You know, based on what you've bought before, here's what you might want to consider now. Do you want to refill this? You know, are you buying vitamins? Do you need more? You know, those types of things. And um, it really can predict what someone might need and when they might need it. Uh, you know, taking a simple example of, Sunscreen, you know, somebody buys sunscreen online and it's a really, we haven't had rain in two months and you think, well, they might be out in the sun a lot. So, you know, we, we see the forecast isn't getting any better. Maybe we can make this recommendation that they need, to, they need more, they need a different type or higher SPF, you know, things like that. So basically it gets to be a lot more contextual and a lot more predictive. And I think the important thing here, no matter how you're using virtual agents, is to make sure that you can escalate to a live agent at any given time. So if somebody's interacting with a non-live agent, no matter what, make it easy and predictive and um, simple. If the customer wants to escalate, make it very easy and straightforward as to how to do that. But if the, the virtual agent is detecting some issues, some frustration, I don't know about you guys, but sometimes when I'm uh, you know, calling in and I have to talk to a, you know, a voice chat bot initially, I'm oftentimes yelling into the phone like, no, agent, agent. You know, you, you, want, to, you want to make that a good experience and, and really make sure that customers can get to who they want um, or, you know, communicate how they want. You know, and, and like it, it's not, I don't always need to talk to a live agent. Sometimes I know that I can do something much quicker by doing a quick web chat or, you know, maybe I do a web chat because I want a paper trail. You know, and my Internet access is, is having challenges, and this is the third time I've had to have someone come out. I don't want to be charged for that. I want to have a paper trail showing me that the agent confirmed I won't be charged for that, you know, but, but it's, a, um, you know, it's in chat form. 
Okay. So um, plans for specific AI capabilities. So you might be saying, okay, great. What's the actual type of technology that I might be looking at or should consider for AI? And when we break down AI in digital customer experience, this list is ever growing. Um, it was probably about two thirds, you know, maybe even less than that uh, this size last year. And we just see more and more activities taking place when it comes to AI with digital customer experience. So the number one area that's in use right now is just personalization. So making making my interaction as much um, you know about me and personal to me as I possibly can be. And then intelligent routing is another big one that we see companies adding AI to the routing, as I mentioned. And then agent analytics, so we talked about that already too. Um, chatbots for both customers and agents. And then you get into a lot of the analytics like um, sentiment analysis and predictive analysis, natural language processing. So if I'm talking or typing, um, the bot can actually understand just natural language. I don't have to speak in any certain form. It can, doesn't matter what language I'm speaking. It can do some um, you know, translation and transcription, uh, the next couple items. Real-time voice transcription is nice, though, too, because as I'm talking, um, the agent is automatically seeing a you know, textual um, you know, in real time almost of, of the conversation and what we're saying being recorded um, <laughs> on a text basis in, right in my file so people can go back and look at that in the future and see what I've said or if it's a little unclear and want to go back and look at something, it's all right there. Um, you know, and then other areas too, self-service RPA, um, you know, IoT, I think that will start growing even more as we move forward. And then some of the um, facial and image recognition right now, low usage, only about, you know, 12.6, 12.2% respectively, but it is one of the fastest growing areas moving forward as you see the difference between the number of companies using today and planning to use over you know, the next couple of years. It's really growing quite a bit. And in fact, let's see, when we look at um, some of the areas that are growing, so basically the way to read this table is it's, those sa it's that same list, all the different types of AI going down the first column. The second column shows what percentage are actually using today, so it's just a little different look at that. The third column shows what additional percentage are planning to use by 2021, and then what additional percentage are planning to use by 2025. So though each of those first three columns are kind of to grow upon each other, they're cumulative. So um, when you look at the, the fourth column, which is green and says total planning, that's just, an, that's just adding up those um, planning to use either by 2021 or 2025, so you can see those highlighted in green are the ones that are having the, the biggest growth. So self-service, predictive analytics, RPA, image recognition, facial recognition are really some of the fastest growing areas. And then in the last column, you can see what the total adoption is by 2025, and that's how this chart is sorted. So just, you know, what, what's the total adoption by the end there? Personalization, self-service, predictive, it just kind of goes in order. Okay, just a couple um, quick charts on uh, analytics, and I'll get to some of the success metrics. So right now we can see that about a third of organizations are using analytics for digital customer experience, but when you look at the success group, um, they're definitely more likely to use analytics, about almost 47% doing now, and another 50.7% planning to use. And there's also um, quite a bit of companies actually integrating their contact center with their analytics, so really making sure that the communications piece of it can integrate with the analytics and also even with CRM as well, although I don't have that in the chart right here, but this just shows you that we do see some utilization, a lot of utilization, a lot of growth when it comes to analytics, which is important because without analytics, without the data, without the information, I don't think we can do a whole lot when it comes to AI and customer experience. We have to know how we're doing and how it's working. Um, most organizations do gather customer feedback, so that's good, right? You can see on the left-hand side about almost 67% are gathering customer feedback. They're doing post-call surveys or net promoter score or CSAT score or customer effort score, you know, any, any of the number. Some of them are doing just their own uh, internally developed scoring system. But you can see that of the success group, 86% actually gathering customer feedback, so a lot more companies um, in the success group, so obviously gathering customer feedback does correlate with success, as well as using a customer health score. So um, this is putting together various factors of um, what your customer is doing, how they're rating you, what they're spending, 
to come up with a customer health score and how, how you're doing. About 43.6% of companies are doing that today, but as you can see, 59, a little over 59% of the success group actually uses a customer health score as a, as a good barometer of how they're performing. They can get a little more granular. Um, we'll talk about organizational structure in a future webinar, but it's very important to have a chief customer officer in place. What does that person do? Well, one of the big things a chief customer officer is doing is always monitoring that customer health score and getting granular to figure out, okay, wait, why are we going down or why are we going up? Let's do more of what we're doing to make it go up and let's figure out why we're going down and fix those problems ASAP. You know, we don't want those to fester. All right, so when we look at success metrics when organizations use artificial intelligence, um, obviously it's the analytic tools that are providing us these success metrics. So very important there. Okay, just waiting for my slide. There we go. Um, all right, so primary business goals for AI and digital customer experience. What we really want to do is look at what are your primary business goals for using AI with digital customer experience, and then let's measure that, right? So you can see it all kind of boils up to increasing revenue, reducing costs, or improving customer experience. And in all cases, the success group um, sees you know, these goals as more important. You know, bigger percentage of them are actually using each one of these goals than all others. But still, a decent number of companies you know, saying, hey, we're going to use AI and we're going to you know, uh, do one of these three things. As you can see, the biggest gap is in revenue. So we saw the success group at a much higher percentage actually looking at increasing revenue than all others. So, um, you know, I think that sometimes is a bold move and it depends on how you're using AI, you know, if it's in a sales contact center or if you're really trying to push um, sales in a self-service mode, you're going to, you know, really be focusing on using AI for increasing revenue. But, you know, you, you certainly can reduce some of your operational costs when you're using AI. Again, we'll talk about that in the upcoming webinar on budgets and and we have some real-world numbers on what companies are spending, what the difference is between their spend in a chat bot versus a, a live agent, so we'll get into some of that. And then, um, you know, of course, improving CX. So, okay, great, I'm using AI. Well, if my customers aren't rating me higher and they're, in fact, rating me lower, then I've got issues, you know, if that's the only thing I've changed in my interaction. So you can see, again, you know, success group is selecting increased revenue about 40%, 49% more than all others. So um, most say AI is working well at this point, so we wanted to really kind of take a, you know, just a snapshot of how it was working, and then in future years we're going to continue to ask this question and see how it changes over time, but this is the first year we asked it. So basically we've got about 47% of companies saying, you know, it's working great for both our basic and our advanced functions, which is pretty good. It was higher. That's higher than I thought it would be. Um, you know, about 35% are saying, well, it's working well, but just for those basic functions. That's it. I get into more advanced functions, it's either not working or we're not doing advanced functions, but we're just looking at basic functions. Now, small percentage, about 8.6% saying it's just not even working well for basic uh, functions at all. And um, some very small percentage, 3.9% uh, say it's just not working well for any functions. And we are, in fact, scaling back our deployment. And anecdotally, as I saw companies um, looking at that, they were, uh, oh, you know what, I realized I didn't move the slide forward. Hold on, guys, let me get that forward for you. There we go. I'll give you a second to look at that. But um, anyway, uh, when companies were actually scaling back their deployments, um, it, it, it was really a lot of a lot of times they just went too fast. They went too fast, too much, too strong, too hard right at the beginning, and they didn't give it time. Um, they they just they didn't really give enough focus. They didn't have an identified business case that they were trying to solve. They just kind of, you know. Um, in some cases, it was vendors selling more than they could do, things like that. So there were a lot of reasons for that, but it was a pretty small percentage. So let's look at what we see when we're actually measuring success and what kind of results we can see. So um, first of all, about 62.4% of companies overall in our research study were actually measuring the success of AI for their customer experience initiatives. And of that group, about 53% of those that we're measuring success are in our success group. So just to be clear on who's in it. So how do they measure success? Um, and this is within the success group. You can see measuring revenue, cost, and CX. And then, or I'm sorry, I think that was overall. That wasn't just, that, that was all companies all combined, sorry. And then um, when we look at the improvements that they saw, um, annual, it, it, these are all annualized. So some in some cases, organizations were only, 
um, a few weeks in or a few quarters in. And so they gave us a time frame of where they were, and we just annualized everything out. So basically, um, you can see, <coughs> excuse me, with small companies, they had um, a nice improvement in revenue on average, you know, 8.3 million, and were, had reduced costs by 1.3 million. Mid-size, 60 million dollars of new revenue generated through <coughs> AI initiatives, and about 337 in cost decreases. And then large companies had the biggest increase in new revenue, as you can see there, pretty significant increase for larger companies, especially the multi-billion dollar companies. I mean, as a percentage of their overall revenue, it might not be huge, but it's a, it's a big jump. And um, then, of course, with cost reduction, it's a little bit less, because as I mentioned before, those larger companies went in, spent a lot of money initially. Um, they're spending a lot of money on data scientists and um, those to program their data sets, so they're still in that mode in a lot of cases. So I expect that cost reduction to go up as they're able to program and um, you know, put into service their, their bots that they're customizing and using. And then when you look at customer ratings, huge improvements in customer ratings, um, regardless of the size of the company and the success group. You can see small organizations seeing about a 72% improvement in their ratings mid-size and more than doubling their customer success ratings and uh, large uh, almost doubling. So it's, it, this is basically we just combined all ratings they were doing and figured out the percentage of um, you know, CSAT, net promoter score, post-call survey, internally developed, and transactional net promoter score was what was included there. So, I mean, you know, just kind of the key takeaway here, yeah, AI is going to result in some good, compelling success. Getting into even more of the details, this is just kind of drilling down one more level. This looks at what, what their revenue was. I'm just, I have these numbers for cost and, and um, customer experience as well, but I just wanted to kind of point out revenue because that was such an important um, success factor here and such an important business goal. But you can see just the befores and afters for small, mid-sized, and large companies, um, and then all others um, on the, the revenue side. And the, the differences, the jumps, were, were much more significant in the success group than they were in all others. I mean, there still was an improvement with all other companies. If, even if you just look at the um, bottom with all sizes there, the, the one that's highlighted in blue, you know, you can see that it was, and still went up from, you know, 226 million to 237 million. Um, on all others, but the jump in uh, the success group was 162 million up to 232 million. So definitely a bigger jump there overall. And um, you know, basically what companies did now. I will also say that you know, in talking to organizations, in some cases this is very hard to measure, as you might imagine, because uh, there are a lot of factors that could go into revenue. Typically, what we saw um, when companies did it and had numbers on it, uh, it was for a specific product line, a specific initiative, a specific location, out of a specific contact center. There were, there were some very isolated ways they were looking at this. And because it was their business goal that they set forth to do, you know, they basically did the four measurements. They took their baseline right ahead, right up front, and, and measured it. You know, they basically said, okay, where are we today? What's our revenue today? And now we're going to add AI, and let's keep measuring these numbers and see how they're changing. Now, of course, you could argue that there are other external factors that could come into play. It could be something as you know, macro as the economy got better, or you know, it could be something else that they're doing. Maybe their products got better. So there certainly are other factors that could go into play here. But in many of the cases, as we talk to organizations, um, you know, they said, no, we're, we're, we're pretty clear on this, and, and it was pretty isolated, and we were able to attribute a lot of this to, a, you know, to, to the addition of AI. Another way um, we looked at this as well was um, with ratings. So I talked earlier, I wanted to kind of bring this into to play too, because I talked earlier about the number of channels that you're using and how we were able to show success. So you can see in the bar chart there on the left, you know, just as companies were using, you know, as they were looking at what their metric was, what was their business goal, revenue, cost, CX score, um, you can see again that the, the success group was using more channels uh, than all others, regardless of what their um, you know their success metric is, I just want to look at well, does that make a difference? Nope. No matter what, the success group is using more. So I wanted to really drill down into okay, if I'm using more channels, do my customer ratings go up? And in fact, they do. And uh, the more channels you're using, the more your customer ratings are going up. So you can see, you know, if you're using one to four channels, the improvement in your customer ratings once you add those additional AI-enabled channels. 55%. Um, five to channel, seven channels, it goes up by about 60%. But you start adding even more, eight plus, 
your increase in customer ratings is up by 90%. So we're definitely seeing correlation between adding more channels, adding AI to those channels, AI enabling them, and then the success. Um, among our success group, of course, this is among the success group. Now, if you're not doing it well, you're not adding omnichannel, which most successful companies are, then I can't, you know, I, I couldn't say that your um, your success ratings will necessarily go up. Okay, so just um, a couple quick case studies before we wrap up. I just I kind of like to make this real. Um, so, how are companies? What are companies doing? Um, there is one that I thought was really interesting: University Health System, and. Um, what they were doing was using workflow automation for their hiring process. It basically was able to reduce the time that it took them to hire new physicians, new nurses, you know, new people in the healthcare system. And their goal was basically not only to get people onboarded faster, but to boost the satisfaction of the new hires. So, you know, that gets around, oh yeah, it was a good experience and they can get more people. Um, but also to increase the revenue to the university because basically what they were finding was the longer it took them to hire someone, every day that went by they were losing revenue because those clinicians weren't in there generating revenue at the university. Um, so they use some automation, they use e-signatures, analytics, and reporting here to really pull things together. Uh, they were able, and it was, and some of it was just, you know, just true workflow automation. Um, and they were able to reduce hiring time from 72 days down to 24 days. And they were able to add $144,000 in revenue for every new hire. And they had a lot of new hires. They're growing very quickly just because they were able to onboard faster. So this was a huge success, something that the IT, um, you know, sort of like the IT healthcare informatics team just took on themselves. They saw this as a weakness and just built something from the ground up, and it was hugely successful. And they're using it in other areas of the university now as well. So that was a good example of just, you know, IT taking hold of things and saying, look, we're going to fix this and we're going to use technology to fix it. Uh, another case study was a utility that was using real-time analytics. So this was um, looking at analytics between agents and customers. Again, to, like I talked about earlier, to determine whether the agents were actually following their script, whether they needed more training or coaching, and also just to kind of look at which calls can we automate. You know, as we, as we start looking through what, what are our agents talking to their customers about, where can we use more self-service because that will reduce our operational costs and potentially increase our customer ratings. So, um, you know, the goal was to increase self-service, also to improve the agent performance when self-service isn't going to work. It isn't sufficient to what a customer wants. You can see some of the technologies that they were using there, Barrett and Genesis. Um, the outcome, they had an improvement in self-service. So uh, this was early on. I, I'm, I haven't checked back in with them, but you know, after about a quarter of doing this, they saw self-service utilization increase by 5%, and their CSAT scores went up by about 7%. So definitely saw some quick um, you know, return on that investment. And this one, one of my favorite ones, is um, a high-tech company that was adding AI for complaints. And this one concerned me because I thought, boy, you're adding AI for complaints. That could be a little bit risky. So basically, you know, customers can raise their issues over any channel, and um, they would analyze it using natural language processing, and then they would match what's the probability we can resolve this issue um, using self-service. And you know they had a pre-established setting there, and they would route the call based on where you know the probability was greatest. And their goal was to com to close as many complaints as they could without human intervention. And uh, you can see they were using Salesforce via Cisco in the Contact Center, but Salesforce was their AI they were using here. Um, the outcome was incredible. Um, so they saw an improvement in both CSAT as well as uh, sales metrics. So um, an operational cost as well. I, sh I should have in there. So they saw an 11% improvement in CSAT. Um, AI now closes 30% of their customer complaints. 30%, more than, more than that actually, slightly more than that, with a 90% success rate in rising. So this was really a huge success story. And in doing all that, you know, in putting, being able to use bots to, you know, to, to close these, um, you know, these issues, these complaints, they were able to reduce their staff needed by about 25%. So really huge success story there as well. Okay, so just um, providing some recommendations here. So AI definitely is here now, and I'm sure everyone knows that, um, but if you're not using it or planning to use it, at least starting to develop a strategy, I do believe you will be at a competitive disadvantage um, just based on the number of companies who are already 
um, you know, getting into this and looking at it and developing their strategy. I don't think you're at risk if you haven't started yet. I think you're going to be at risk if you don't start very soon, meaning like literally this year. Um, there are many ways to use AI and digital customer experience. I think it's very important to develop your business case and don't rush. You know, um, fit AI into your overall AI roadmap. Right? Don't you know? Don't just look at it in isolation. See what else the company is doing with AI. Maybe in manufacturing things like that. If you're a company that has manufacturing. Measure success. Very, very important to measure success so that you can see what's working, what's not, and so you can get budget in the future. We'll talk more about that in upcoming webinars. So just make sure you're measuring your baseline first before you start anything because you can't go back and remeasure if you didn't take those metrics up front. So decide what you're gonna what you're gonna look at, see where you are today, and then be able to, you know, measure success you know on a on a regular basis, whether that's weekly, monthly, quarterly, annually. Um, and just leverage the data that I presented here to, to help you to compare where you are with other companies. And then, um, of course, stay uh, tuned for additional webinars in this, this series because we're going to be doing a lot more on the research. And then there's a variety of ways we can help. If you're an enterprise organization, we do all kinds of stuff with this data. We um, are developing a, a maturity assessment in the um, digital customer experience space overall. And we can do some workshops on how IT leaders can be trusted advisors to a variety of business units. Um, you know, KPI development, so what success metrics should you be using to track these transformational projects that you're doing? Um, you know, how can you help, uh, how, how can AI actually help you with some of these projects and strategies that you're doing today? We can help you with um, RFPs and RFIs and also, you know, help you with that technology and vendor selection and assessment. We do a lot of, um, you know, just guidance looking at success metrics. So how do you look compared to other organizations, and that's a lot of the maturity um, model that we develop. And then, of course, um, cost models as well. For vendors, um, actually for enterprise organizations as well, we do a research advisory service. Um, that's an annual relationship. You can get custom cuts of any of this data we talked about here or, or, or any of our research areas that, we, um, that I highlighted earlier in the, the presentation. You get, everyone gets access. We don't use seats or tracks, so everyone at the organization gets access. This is a great time to start looking at that as you're looking into budgets for 2020. Uh, we do custom inquiries, so if you have a question, you don't have to go looking through uh, all these different reports to find your answer. You just submit your question. We give you a written response because we know our data a lot better than anyone else, so we can do it a lot quicker than you can. Um, you know, various strategy sessions, um, the strategy consulting, and cost models as well. And then upcoming reports in, in this space, we're going to be doing um, vendor ratings and success correlations, um, TCO and ROI analysis for using AI in the contact center or in customer engagement initiatives overall. You, know, you may or may not have a contact center. And then um, I, I mentioned our maturity index. This is the intelligent customer uh, engagement maturity model where we look at um, practices and how they – relate to where you are on the maturity curve. So we look at you either being unprepared, reactive, proactive, and anticipatory. So it can be one of those four areas. And we give you the, the specific guidance of, okay, where are you compared to other companies when, it, when we look at a bunch of different criteria, you know, use of AI here, use of this type of AI, uh, you know, use of the contact center, um, omni-channel, so on. All right, Erwin, I think at this point I turn it back over to you. Yes, uh, wonderful presentation, Robin. Thank you. Uh, before we head into Q&A, we'll have about a minute or so for q and I want to draw your attention to the links in the Attachments tab. You'll see a registration link for our next webinar presented again by Robin, uh, Episode 2, Top 5 Must-Haves for Your Next Generation Contact Center, which will be presented on August 29th. Please uh, click on the link, and you can register through that link. I would also like to invite you to participate in our research. You'll see a link to our upcoming studies. If you fill out that form, we'll be in touch to include you in our, our study. Uh, again, we don't share any of your information outside of Nemertes, and you'll receive complimentary access to the study when it's complete. Um, Robin, I've got time for about one question. <laughs> okay. um, one must be careful not to assume that workflow automation implies AI. Can you clarify the difference between workflow automation and AI? No, yeah, that, that's absolutely true. I mean, you, you can have workflow automation with or without AI. Um, so, I mean, I'm just, I guess I'm just validating that. I mean, you can, you can automate something used, using just um, – you know, program, basically static programs, or you can make that more um, AI-enabled to where it's going to change based on what the, what the AI data set is learning. So, yeah, it, it can be either, either or. 
I do see one quick question there about whether data, the side data can be segmented by B2B and B2C, and yes, we, we've segmented the data by B2C, B2B, and both. Excellent, and uh, a replay is available. If you're an Emerdy's client, uh, contact us for a, a copy of the slides. Otherwise, um, we, we do not provide a copy of the slides, but the entire presentation, that, uh, the source data for this that, that Robin mentioned is available for purchase on our website, or please contact us for additional information for to access our research. With that, uh, I think we will wrap up. Again, thank you so much for joining us, and this concludes our webinar. Thank you.